Hi, I'm Grant Diggles with Health Professionals Alliance and your host of The Real Doc Show. We're talking with Dr. Dan about a private equity deal he did in the past, what he learned from it, what his experience was, and we're going to get his opinions on that experience. But before that, if you are an independent practice in medical and dental, and you want to protect your independence and thrive into the future, HPA has a message for you. Don't get consolidated. Instead, join the HPA family with other independent practices and groups across the country in both medical and dental. Protect your independence, control your patient care, thrive in the market, and build your wealth. To learn more about this exciting movement, we invite you to visit hpamembers.com, get more information, schedule some time with us, and let's talk about how we can help create transformative change in your practice. As always, we invite you to subscribe to our channel so you get the most recent updates on the episodes that are rolling out. So without further ado, let's get started. As I mentioned before, we are going to be talking about my medical group sold to private equity. This is my opinion. And today we are going to be talking with Dr. Dan. Let's go ahead and jump into this. Dr. Dan, it is a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for being here. How are you doing this morning? You ready to cover this material? (laughs) I certainly am. And I'm thankful to be here. Appreciate all your efforts. Well, it's the pleasure is mine for starters, because I think we're bringing a topic here that has a lot of value. So um, just to get started in uh, the show, can you give just a brief background on, uh, you know, your career, uh, what what you've been up to, and uh, then we're going to jump right into this this content. I'm very excited about it. So I'm giving you the floor. All right. Well, thanks. I'm a 62 year old retired anesthesiologist. Uh, I did my training in the Midwest as a one year of general surgery, three years of anesthesiology residency with a concentration in uh, cardiac anesthesia. Very good. That was quick and concise and to the point. So let's jump into this thing. So you were part of a group that ended up agreeing to jump into a private equity deal. Um, and the thing I love about this topic for you is that you you started independent and there was some growth and things that occurred in the independent market. So you got to have that experience and then you jumped into uh, this private equity deal and then you had that experience and you had that contrast between independence, you had the experience of uh, private equity and now you're completely out of all of it. You're in retirement at this point in your life and you have this opportunity to kind of look back and see those comparisons, see what it was like independently and then what kind of changed when you guys went into this private equity deal. So uh, my first question for you is let's start before the private equity uh, deal occurred. So let's go back to when you were a private practice still. Um, tell tell me a little bit about that because we've already covered some things. So right, you, yeah, go ahead. So it's like I, you start small and started aggregating. So go with that. Right. I started in private practice with a professional corporation in, in 92, 1992, mm-hmm. and worked, you know, work, work, work until about four years in, uh, I was elected by the other members to go on our board of directors. At that point in time, uh, we started negotiating with a single hospital based group and, and getting in preparation for this discussion, I realized that when we were negotiating with that group, we used several of the key phrases that were eventually used uh, to persuade my my larger group into inking the deal on a, a private equity acquisition. The phrases that we were using is bigger is better. We did, mm-hmm. we did, uh, I because I did cardiac, we did the cardiac cases that were at that hospital. And we did a lot of the major vascular cases that were done at that hospital. So there was a little bit of a, a split. And so, you know, we said, you know, bigger is better. Uh, you don't want to become hospital employees. You don't want the, the hospital system to replace you 
with another regional or national group. And we used all those phrases in the course of, of uh, discussing the acquisition of this smaller group. Okay. And it was successful. Uh, and because I was the most inexperienced board member, uh, we gave up two seats on the board to the incoming group. So at that point in time, I ceased being on the board. But like I said, I, in preparing for this, I looked back and I thought, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so you started private. You started merging with other private groups, right? right. Within Within the market that you were in. Um, and one of the things that I thought was really interesting that you mentioned when we had a conversation earlier is that your the structure of the company was a certain type of legal structure, right? And then, you know, you talk about moving forward and that structure changed. So what was that change? What, in the early what was the justification for it? Yeah, in the early 2000s, or 2010s, excuse me, we then had a, a significant overlap with another group in our area. Uh, once again, we were doing a lot, most if not all of the cardiac and the bigger, bigger and is better concept came up. And in that, in, in, in that, uh, consolidation, um, to my best recollection, the change, we, they changed the format of our group. We went from being a professional corporation to a provider network. And the, the explanation of that was that it made us an entity that would be more attractive to a to further consolidation or uh, acquisition. Specifically, we were, specifically, though, when we're talking about that further consolidation, meaning that you were positioning yourself or could position yourself to an easy, it, an easier avenue into a consolidation with maybe potentially a, a private equity group or some sort of, you know, from a powered by a hedge fund. It was that, was that the real strategy behind it? Was it like, just get you positioned there so that if the opportunity ever arises, you at least have the option to exercise it when the time comes. Is that close? Yes, that's, that okay. pretty much describes it. But like I said, the depth of that, the depth of the explanation that you just gave is significantly deeper than the explanation that the rank and file members were given to my recollection. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> so you present, you present, you, you have the, you aggregate privately, you pick up smaller groups within your area. You end up changing the structure of the company to from, what was it a, from a kind of a PC group? And you moved corporation, it away yes. To, and to an entity called a provider network. A provider network. And why, why, what's the uniqueness of a provider network? Dif why is it different from a PC? What's the, what's the benefit well, strategy of that? Uh, to my understanding, only physicians can own uh, professional corporations. The professional, okay. the professional has to be the owner of a professional corporation. Anybody can own a private provider network, to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that that's a huge difference right there, which makes sense why you positioned with the possibility of having that option. So you position yourself there, everything's going, and then let's get into the meat and potatoes of this thing. So finally, a private equity group appears out of nowhere looking for opportunities to expand their network. They approach you and the group. So let's let's talk about, um, you know, you you it sounds like the group had things already kind of going and were going well and you guys were profitable and there was not a huge need in the group to actually do a private equity deal. So what were some of the things that, or the selling points that private equity, when they finally approached you, what did they lay in front of you to say, hey, here's the reasons you should do a private equity deal. Do you remember what, what those were, what they were suggesting anyway? Well, of course, when you're dealing with physicians, one of the best and, and most frequent things here is you guys are physicians and we are business people. So mm -hmm. the, the grand version of, we think we know better. So we actually, I believe discussed with several, uh, private equity, uh, groups and pick the one that we thought would be most beneficial and allow us to remain, 
with as much control as possible in in a in a field where you're going to be given up control. Okay. Yeah, that's an interesting paradigm. How you just said that, as yeah. much control as possible in an environment where you're giving up control. Correct. And so, so uh, the, the the value prop, for lack of a better term, is well, our back our back office will be better. Uh, mm -hmm. Our resource utilization will be better. Uh, resource utilization in anesthesia language is your scheduling will be better. You'll be more efficiently scheduled. Um, uh, you know, there's an opportunity to access the capital markets, which I guarantee you that none of us understood at the time. Uh, <laughs> you'll have you'll have stock, which should appreciate and value. Um, we'll have better negotiating skills, or we will say that we have better negotiating skills. So in reality, uh, what you give up uh, at the initiation of the deal will hopefully uh, come back to you uh, with uh, better better quality contracts in the future. Okay, so those are those are all pretty. I mean, let's get real. You're talking about, you know, we can provide you with more resources, whether those are human resources or financial resources. We can provide you with uh, better insurance contracting rates because we're going to we're going to bring in market leverage and things of that nature. Um, you know, we can take care of the back office for you. So it's it kind of sounds like okay, we can do all these things for you that really allows you to be a doctor and be more profitable, make more money, so you can focus on your craft, and we'll take care of everything else. Plus, plus you get a check and. Um, probably some stock and things like that. And I mean, those are all pretty powerful val value propositions, right? Correct. So my que my next question for you is I want to back up just a little bit and go back to the due diligence process uh, it, with the private equity group. So it, when you, you said you looked at multiple private equity groups, you decided on a particular one to engage in conversation with and due diligence. And so what was the due diligence process like for your group? Because this is an important one because a lot of doctors that are considering private equity, the due diligence is everything. And finding that fine print, understanding what it means, asking the right questions, uh, you don't necessarily know how to do that. So you're relying on counsel in a variety of different aspects to go to bat for you and to basically take this legalese from something that's very uh, probably a little bit difficult to, to understand. And these, these council people that you hire to look at this are supposed to make this digestible and understandable for you. Right. Correct. Correct. So this due diligence that you went through, who did you have in your due diligence corner? I, I let's call it that. In, in representing you and advising you on, on whether or not this was a good deal? What did that look like? Well, in it, our, the people who had been our accountants for several years were our primary financial uh, uh, advisors or counsel in this deal. And they, they made it clear that, yes, you're going to give some things up. You're going to get, uh, you know, you get a decent sized check, um, but you're going to give up some aspects of your uh, financial freedom in, in the, in the process of that. And then there's the legal okay. side of the equation where um, the original, the original contract uh, for the, for that we inked is somewhere in excess of about an inch and a half thick. Wow. And uh, we spent over a year, uh, going over it, but when you're working and you've got kids, you assume that the board mm -hmm. of directors is getting um, the advice that should make it safe and efficient for all of you. You can't, uh, anybody that's been in anesthesia for any length of time, you have to have a representative uh, sort of structure. Otherwise, you'll never get anything accomplished. Uh, and we had many meetings where you know, that nothing was accomplished because everybody had minute questions and didn't understand this, didn't understand that. And so it would all bog down. So things would get tabled 
and off to the uh -huh. you schedule a meeting for a month later. And so this whole process took well over a year to, to, to the, the process where I'm saying evaluating of the, of the three or four that we were aware of, choosing the one and then proceeding with the one, that whole process took well over a year. Wow. Wow. And so you pick them and two questions and we'll do one and two here. But the first question is, is who did you, how did you find the council that you chose to use? Uh, let's start with that. So you, you mentioned uh, legal counsel and you men mentioned uh, your bookkeeping or your company's accounting. bookkeeping service. So accounting yeah. service. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so that was, so the accounting service was your service. That was a trusted source that you guys have worked with for years. Um, and then the second question is where did your legal counsel from come from? Well, it's a, uh, it's an interesting comment or an interesting, uh, situation in that um we we had legal counsel but there was also uh and i believe they they may have suggested that we should get somebody who is who is familiar with private equity deals okay and, i know i'm asking you a loaded question by the way so <laughs> i'm i'm leading you here dr dan <laughs> <laughs> it's a very loaded question and you're not going to take me to where you want me to go <laughs> uh, I, 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 I know, but I want to, uh, and I but want to, regardless well. of who the legal counsel was, right. Um, there is a lesson to be learned there. Pick your Correct. legal counsel very carefully. And I guess we can leave it at that. Well, or, I, I would, I would say, I would say, let's not leave it at that. And let's just say, okay. make sure that, that your legal counsel is absolutely and directly responsible to you and your group. All right. They should have okay. a, a, <laughs> and a breadth of experience in private equity deals, not just getting them signed, but letting the membership know how things are going to mature in that deal and how, uh, sequential events uh, may affect you in the long run. If they don't have the, if they've never been through a private equity deal and have uh, from start to finish, I mean, not from start to finish of getting the deal on the table and signed, but start to finish from the time uh, the deal starts to be negotiated until you are a participating member in the corporation that purchased you, which means at least as far as through the vesting of the shares that you were granted. Okay. So all the way through and that you actually just jumped on my second question because it sounds like, you know, obviously hindsight's 2020, right? And, and it's easy to be like, Oh, you know, I hindsight's 2020 with Bitcoin right now with everybody. It's like, oh, where was I on that one? But with your particular group, and I want to emphasize this because it's important, do you feel like the group was really kind of focused on the, let's just call it the first half of the deal? Like they were kind of fixated on like, okay, what does a check look like for me? What does the stock look like for me? And, you know, we talk about looking down the road, as you just suggested, like three to five to seven years down the road. What does it look like? How do I get out of this thing? What happens if we sell to somebody else? What does that mean for me? Do you feel like the group was really more focused on the front half of the deal and and really kind of, you know, there were maybe some surprises as this thing kind of completed and then years ensued? And it's like, oh, this is not an area that we did a lot of due diligence on. It's like, how do we, what happens down the road? Is that, am I communicating that pretty accurately? Is that how you felt like the group approached it? Yeah, I think uh, there was quite a bit of, uh, of, oh, not elation, but satisfaction with the fact that we got a deal done uh, because mm. we thought now we have, now we have something that we can work with. We have something that could potentially grow and contribute to our financial well-being for years down the line. Um, mm -hmm. So we were actually fairly pleased with the result. Were there surprises? Yes. Can I tell you <laughs> what they were? No. I'm okay. Eight, I'm, I'm in my eighth year of this deal, and it's been made perfectly clear to me that 
whatever I signed, I'm going to be held accountable for uh, uh, as long as I'm a shareholder. Yeah, so, even as a shareholder, even if you're retired and still as a shareholder, is correct. that is that accurate? So you're still even after retirement, you still have ties to the deal that go beyond that that um, are still causing ramifications for you. Correct. That we don't need to get into. You know, we got to tread lightly around here. But uh, so you ended up doing the deal, right? Okay. So my question for you is, all right, everybody's happy, deals inked, checks were issued or whatever. Uh, and now you have taken a more passive role in the company because now the private equity group is, is kind of calling the shots. They're controlling the accounting, yada, yada, yada. So my question for you is what changed after you did the deal? Like the, there were promises made or there were value propositions put out there. You know, obviously nobody's perfect, so things uh, can vary depending on the environment. But uh, what was your experience with the value propositions versus the the reality? Well, does that make sense? Yeah, when I joined a private corporation, you know, that was your baby. You were contributing to the growth and the success of that mm -hmm. entity, and um, I spent the first 65 to 70% of my career developing relationships with surgeons, uh, you know, uh, letting them know my expectations, them letting know, uh, letting me know their expectations. And so it was all generated towards building a practice that these guys could count on. I had several surgeons that uh, would call me directly, uh, even if I, you know, they knew if I was in town, if they had an emergency case going on and didn't know the players that were on call, I had told them for years, you could, if you don't know the players and you're worried about something, call me directly. I'll come do the case. All right. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. through that mechanism, I had, I had built a fairly specialized practice. Um, and I, I had three and four days a week where I was requested by di different surgeons. So for me, the impact was less so than a, uh, than a lot of my younger colleagues because I was established and had all these, these uh, connections. Uh, I know from many, many conversations with younger colleagues that uh, take, for example, the manpower utilization things. Um, I know many, many people from memory that were in four different hospitals in a day. Wow. The schedule would be such that you would be, you, the only real case that went off on time was the first one. You'd be scheduled. Yep. Be done at 10 o'clock in the, in the morning and scheduled to start a 10, 15 case at a hospital 10 miles away. Because. <laughs> what's the, what's the problem with that? Well, don't you have, don't yeah. you have a teleporter in all the hospitals? Correct. And so, and, you know, just, just obviously getting from one place to another is anxiety producing because now you're behind and now you got to get there. You got to get set up. You got to see the patient surgeon standing there chomping at the bit to get going. So it ends up um, in a private practice situation, you have these relationships and they understand that something is, uh, if you're late, it's, it's for a real reason. Once right. you once you get yourself into an employment situation, uh, all of a sudden, you know they think, well, hey, they they're this big group; they should have plenty of people. The surgeons are you know are feeling that they shouldn't have to start their cases late because there should be plenty of people available. And it turns out that there didn't have any other a greater number of people available. We were just spread out all over the place. And you, you go from having uh, an, an, an internal, as a, in, my, in my experience, you go from having an internal uh, valuation of your career and working situation to being, uh, in, in, in my specific instance, uh, made to be like a cog in a wheel. You were just a body that they needed to get in mm -hmm. a room. So that it sounds like, I mean, I, I can appreciate this uh, because of what I do. 
but it sounds like just for starters, there was a lack of intimate knowledge on how to run this company. And specifically in this example was a lack of knowledge on the scheduling side, right? Um, because as you just described, it's like, as a PC, you fostered relationships, you built structure around providing great service because you can, you had, you controlled all the cards. And then when you moved to a private equity, you gave up a lot of those control features to a group that didn't have the same intimate knowledge and service, um, structure that you had spent years creating. So, uh, you know, and they were putting bodies in places to make sure that they were there for cases without consideration of the nuances that really create a really solid business model and one that has great service, which then, of course, you lose control of that. And then the trickle down effect is deterioration of culture, where now, now the doctors don't have control over certain aspects that they did before. That causes a lot of stress. It causes a lot of anxiety. Uh, there are probably a lot of apologies and explanations. And the culture of the company be continued to deteriorate because there was a lack of knowledge in what actually created a really good service when you were still in the PC realm. Am I summarizing that pretty well for you? Yes, you are summarizing that very well. And like I said, I, <laughs> I can say for my my own experience, you know, I can't speak for the masses that were there. I know I can speak for the ones that I've spoken to. It was, it was a prevalent, uh, feeling and it was, mm -hmm. uh, through many of the people that I spoke to. And it was, a uh, even though I was specialized in what I did, did, it still had that kind of an effect on me. Right. Because so, it was I, just, I, it, cre I, it created an environment. An environment I, I of less than other people were, but it still had a, it was less, but it was still a significant effect on me. Okay. And so really simple question, what happened to job satisfaction with your colleagues based on your experience? Well, my job satisfaction was significantly lessened. Many of my close compadres uh, job mm -hmm. satisfaction was lessened significantly. Uh, so all in all, my impressions and opinion is that job satisfaction was lessened significantly. Okay. And I know I have like so many other questions that why we probably can't go into. <laughs> um because <laughs> you know i have stock questions for you and i have access to financials questions for you and change in income questions for you and given the nature of this particular topic i know we can't get into any of those uh but i know that well runs deep there so i guess that's my very passive way of bringing those up without creating any content to it uh so now you're retired you still are tethered right to to uh the company because you're still in a you know have a stock play um so my question for you is you you, you started practice uh you built a really great company and under the pc realm and then you converted over to the new structure that we talked about um the professional provider network um and now you're on the other side you're retired you're still tethered so let's talk about 2020, you know, hindsight being 2020. And my question is, is tell me a little bit about some of the lessons that you learned from this process and any recommendations that you would um, make to other doctors across the country who are in the stage of considering a private equity deal. So let's start with the lessons. What lessons did you learn uh, going through this now that you have the whole picture? And right. on the other side, right. what, what are some of those pearls of wisdom you can throw out? Well, you absolutely need to have your advisors be familiar with the institution, the, the beginning, the middle, and the end or the, the out game of any private equity deal that you're going to be getting into. Okay. Specifically on the on the on the financial side, there's got to be somebody in your corner who has seen, lived through, read about, 
been involved in, what, however you want to say it, through the duration of a private equity deal. Because things are going to change. You know, you're, it, it, mm-hmm. you know uh, it's just like what you read in any investment that you make. Past performance does not signi- uh, signify future performance. All right. Yep. And mm-hmm. you need to have somebody that's lived through hopefully at least one, if not been exposed to more than one, so they can they can give you, okay, this is how it's going to start. If if A happens, then B, C, and D are going to follow closely thereafter. But if B happens, Q, R, and S are going to happen. Yep. And you got to be prepared for all of those. And if you if, and if you're not, um, all of those questions that you brought up are going to come back up in any other deal. From the legal standpoint, you need a, a group of lawyers that have been involved in private equity deals beforehand, but their allegiance has to be absolutely and completely to your group. Okay. There will be terms that seem to you to be plain English terms that somewhere in the body of the uh, document that you sign will be clearly defined so that when you have a question about anything and you bring this up, the, the answer that you will frequently get, uh, according to my experiences, is, well, it's in the document. Uh-huh. Well, the document's, a, you know, an inch and a half thick of legalese, and unless uh, unless you're going to go through all of that, and it's not like if you got nothing else to do, no wife, no kids, and you're only working 10 hours a day, you could maybe go through and read that appropriately, but... I'll guarantee you that a majority, well, I doubt a majority of my colleagues read through that whole thing. So, uh, yeah, especially if you've got documentation legally that, you know, is written up in so many particular ways where there's references to other parts of the document that you have to go find and understand and put those pieces together. Um, you're right. I mean, how many? Yeah, and let's let's just let's just. That's a great point that we hadn't ha- hadn't talked about beforehand. You're okay. going to more than one document, and they are going to cross reference. And I yeah, and I know I've seen them. It, it's <laughs> it's impressive. Yeah, you know, and you know, you, you could you could maybe get you'd be much better off having gone through uh, a year of law school on top of your MD and your specialization training, then you might be relatively prepared to, to ask quality questions, not necessarily to understand it all, but at least to <laughs> ask quality questions. So looking back on this, um, I think that's great rec- uh, recommendations uh, because I, one of the things that stuck out to me is that you're like, unless you're a doctor that doesn't have kids and you're only working 10 hours a week, uh, hours does a anybody really have time or 10 hours a day? Yeah. Uh, you you know how many of the doctors are really actually reading this this documentation? If it's an inch and a half thick, and uh, probably not very many, and so they are relying really heavily on that counsel to uh, be working on their behalf because it probably should be assumed that these doctors are probably not reading all the documentation. They're probably pretty focused on the value propositions that are putting being put in front of them. Like, yeah, more resources, growth, leverage in the market, better contracts. Like that, man, I love all these things. Um, so it's really up to the, the council to literally put this in eighth grade terms for the doctors to say, look, here's, here's what will happen. And if everything happens according to what they say, then everything is going to be honky dory and happy and happy. But there's any variations here. If anything goes downhill, if, if it goes sideways, these are the real things you need to focus on to know um, how bad this can, can really get. So let's, let's not think rainbows and unicorns all the time. Let's really talk about, okay, rainbows and unicorns got it. We'll shelf that. Let's talk about when the sun goes away and the rain comes out and things don't go well. Um, it sounds like your recommendation is that that's really where the focus needs to be for the doctors to know where I guess I don't want to, I guess the only way I can say this is where the trappings are in these deals. So one of the things that I wanted to ask you, knowing that you've been 
you know, in this from the very beginning as a PC, then he went into private equity. You're, now you're retired on the other side. The, the real simple question is, is knowing what you know now, would you do this again? Well, looking back on it, um, what is going to be presented to you is an orchestrated presentation of financial theater that is designed to amplify and exaggerate a physician or a dentist's fear of being able to financially succeed without consolidating into a larger group. Um, it's difficult for me to uh, agree with that concept, but mm -hmm. they, they have planned this thing out for what they feel is the duration that they want to be in the deal. So they know they have a, my, my belief is they have a general idea how years one and two are going to go, how years three and four are going to go. They've got, my belief is they have multiple exit strategies or partial exit strategies, none of which do the physicians or the dentists understand when they sign the paperwork. So mm -hmm. you have to understand that you're being, it's, it's sort of like a, for lack of a better term, it's in the computer or the phone industry. It's like a planned obsolescence. Hmm. We're on a plan. <laughs> control. So it's kind of, I mean, to summarize, like it's kind of uh let, if we just simplified it, it's like they use scare tactics to make you believe that you can't survive without them. And, uh, I mean, is that about summarize it? You exactly. give a much That's more eloquent, <laughs> you know, sentence. I'll give you that. That is my that is my belief. Okay, that's fair enough. If I'm remembering the numbers correctly, I was about even on the deal at six years. Okay. All right. Um, and that included. Uh, at about a six and a half year mark, it included an unexpected dividend, which got us close, got me close to being even based on what you give up and how long it takes to get mm -hmm. that all back. Right now, in the long run, I should be uh, ahead. Yep. Um, but that's not for certain. Right. And that's, that's only speaking, in my specific instance, financially. The, the culture and the satisfaction between my private practice experience and my corporate medicine experience was a significant, in my personal opinion, a significant downgrade um, in the work environment and the satisfaction of what I garnered uh, from my practice. Uh, I went from being an owner to an employee. I went from being what I felt was a valued member of my smaller group to a, to a cog in the wheel. And once again, these are my own personal opinions. Yeah. But I, I went from, you know, just get a body in the room, you know, um, and you get, you get four phone calls a day frequently about, well, hey, I know you're not on call, but we need this covered. And, and they're calling me about somebody that I, that I like to work with. All right. But it's like, no. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I'm not on call. There are plenty of people on call. Um, no. So I went from it being my corporation, my professional corporation, where – no, you, we got to do the work mm -hmm. to because it's beneficial to our other medical colleagues and to myself. And that subconscious, that value, uh, you know, it's your baby kind of thing goes away. Just it's and it starts to go away pretty, pretty early for a lot of people uh, in my like I said. Mine didn't get, my practice didn't change all that much. So it took maybe nine months for, for me to start to sense the, 
the change. Others mm-hmm. of my group felt it in six months. So you kind of lost pride of ownership yep. because of that feeling of being an employee or treated like one, being a cog in the wheel. Um, and so what you're saying is like, back to my original question here, would you do it again? It sounds like you, you know, you had two options here, right? This was the stay independent and this was go private equity. You ended up going private equity. And what I'm hearing you say is that you basically, in your opinion, and from your experience, you kind of ended up financially somewhat in the same spot, regardless of each which one you took, but the private equity deal that you did created a much more bumpy road for you to get there. You felt unappreciated, uh, like again, you were a cog in a wheel and the culture degenerated in the, in the company because there was no pride in ownership anymore. And you're still just now kind of, you pick that path and just now kind of catching up to what you would have made if you just stayed PC the entire time but you would have had way fewer headaches and the culture of the company would have been way different. Is that, is that about right? That's, that's my feelings of the situation. Yes. And then assuming that everything continues to go the way it's supposed to with this deal, being that you're still tethered to the company, there is a possibility that you might be, you might break even or maybe get, get ahead a little bit uh, at the end, if that, if it occurs. So correct. <sighs> the timing of that, the timing of that, uh, and granted, it's a market, it's a market opportunity, even though it's a private market opportunity. Mm-hmm. So you are, uh, because of the private nature of the thing, you have, uh, you have no, con- you have no visualization, for lack of a better term, of the share price other than what you're given. Also, right. Since it's a private market, you don't have the liquidity that you would have if it were a public entity. So Correct. you lack liquidity, you lack access to uh, an investment that you, that you have participated in. And so you have actually no say or very little say in that uh, how, how you wrap up. Like I said, I'm, I'm retired now. I have almost no say in how that that gets wrapped up. Yeah, and then the, and I know you can't speak into this, but I'm just going to say it is it's the uniqueness for you is you're retired. So, but there's a lot of doctors in that deal still that are still working and probably have quite a few years to go, right? Correct. So if the private equity deal does eventually get to a liquidation stage and they do sell to a second sale, I mean, that bodes well for you because there's a good possibility you can completely detether from them and right. get your payout. But then the doctors that are still in the system on that second sale have to ride the next ride, whatever, whatever the next roller coaster is, they're still in. Well, yeah, well this is a, this is a, you bring up a valid point and that is, um, you, when we started our deal, we chose who we wanted to work with. Mm-hmm. As the deal matures, that could that whole deal could be sold off to somebody else who we yep. who we never dealt with, and so now you're you know and there was a there was a reason we chose who we chose we chose the group that we were most comfortable with, but. They could sell it to anybody, and now you're working for somebody you have no knowledge of, no history with, um, and mm-hmm. me, my, for me specifically, that thought didn't enter my head until a year, year and a half, two years into the deal. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> that would have been nice to have thought about ahead of time. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's... Um and it is something that needs to be considered because, you know, I think a lot of these deals, and again, this is my opinion. So what I'm about to say is not the truth, but a lot of these deals that that does need to be considered like, okay, I have stock in this deal and that's great, but I've got 15 more years to work. So what happens when 
you sell to the second sale and wh- what does that look like and what's going to change for me? Am I going to be even treated more as an employee? Is this going to be, is it going to be converted to, you know, major production requirements? Like there's all these things. And then what happens to my stock is, do I have a liquidation stage there or don't I? Like, these are all questions that probably should be asked. And I really appreciate that you're recommending to others based on your experience and, and your opinions that you really need to be looking not just at the deal at hand, but what is going to change after the deal occurs? And then what happens if it goes sideways? And then what happens if everything goes great and you stay on schedule for you know that second sale? Well, then what happens at the second sale? Because now we're all working for somebody different. And what happens to my stock? And, and, and. Yeah, yeah and, um, and, 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 and the start of that word is, is the same start as angst. <laughs> with more and more angst. Okay. Yep. Sorry. So, yeah. So I, I really appreciate, um, I really appreciate your time, Dr. Dan, for being on the show with us and, and sharing these pearls of wisdom. Uh, I hope that people that watch this can get something out of it that equips them to ask the right questions. And, and actually one thing I do want to say is, uh, you know, Health Professionals Alliance is a company where we're fiercely committed to helping independent practices stay independent, both medical and dental. And we don't talk a lot about it during the show because we're featuring other topics. Uh, but even HPA, we have created a private equity questionnaire for doctors who are considering it. It's 40 questions long of questions we feel that if a doctor wants to consider doing a private equity deal, here is what we can equip you with to do the correct due diligence and making sure that you understand completely what you're getting into. And it's why HPA exists because we, we want to see independent practice thrive. We want to see it perpetuated into future generations. And one of the questions I always ask doctors is like, what kind of healthcare system do you want to be in when you need care later on in your life? Do you want to be in a corporate model and getting care that's dictated on profiteering? Or do you want to be in a model and be seen by doctors that have control of their patient care, have uh, independence in determining what's in your best interest? And so we really, if you're considering a private equity deal, feel free to reach out to HPA. You can go to our website website at hpamembers.com. Reach out to us and say, hey, I heard you guys have this questionnaire. Can you shoot this over to us? And we would like to equip you with that so that you're if you decide to do a private equity deal, it is right for some people. So we're not saying it's wrong for everybody, but at least we want to equip you with the answers so you can do the due diligence you need to make sure that you're asking the right questions and you know exactly what you're getting involved in. So, uh, Dr. Dan, I really appreciate you being on the show with me today. Thank you so much for your time. And, um, That concludes The Real Doc Show, where we talk with real doctors, we talk about real topics, and we spotlight real solutions. Thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Dan. My pleasure. Nice talking with you. As always.